Hello there, that Vector Podcast is here. Uh, we are rolling in the season two of this podcast. And uh, so today we have like a bridge, uh, so to say, from US to Finland. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to Doug Turnbull, uh, staff relevance engineer at Shopify. And uh, Doug used to be a CTO at uh, Open Source Connections, uh, the company behind so many tools uh, for us, relevance engineers and relevance product managers as I am today. Um, he is the original creator of Cupid and Splainer and also learning to rank, uh, rank yeah, my shirt. Yeah. Elasticsearch. Yay. Cupid.com. Awesome. Great to have you here. Hi, Doug. How are you doing? I'm great. Yeah, I'm doing great. Excited to chat about uh, where a search is going and and the exciting places that uh, that our uh, you know search is going to head and everything. So finally, I get to be on this podcast. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Long overdue, and uh, you are the legendary guest. Um, so I'm I'm super excited to talk to you, and uh, a lot to cover. Uh, but before we begin. Um, could you spare a few minutes uh, talking through your background, how you ended up in search? Was it an accident or was it not? Was it calculated? I would say it's mostly an accident. So what happened was, so for a long time, the first chapter of my career, the first half was being C and C++ developer. And I kind of got really into performance. Uh, so optimizing speed and in native code. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, I, I moved down here to Charlottesville in 2012 from the D Washington, D.C. area. A couple, So I was a couple hours away from my work. And I found that, like, you know, I was kind of at the time, especially being one remote employee for an in-office uh, company. It was just a nightmare. So we had this neighborhood block party, and I decided to wear a nerdy T-shirt just to see, like, oh, maybe I'll meet other developers. And I think the shirt said something like, my code doesn't have any bugs. It just has features or something or random features. Um, and I so happened to run into Eric Pugh, who's the founder of Open Source Connections. And sort of one thing led to another. And I got, uh, I was like, oh, this seems cool. It's a small company. Always wanted to try out consulting and contracting. And so, yeah, we, I ended up getting the job and, uh, getting more and more into search. Yeah, awesome. And, and you spent there how long? Seven more years? About eight years. Eight years. Yeah, it's a, it's a long... Um, yeah, a long time. Yeah, it was a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. And you've done so much. I mean, I, I was literally in my previous job at AlphaSense, I was um, my last... So I spent there 10 and a half years and my last um, half a year, I was focusing on learning to rank. And I could oh, not cool. find I could not find a better resource than Hello LTR uh, repo on GitHub that you have oh, created. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it was it was an amazing journey because first of all I had to learn it. On the other hand, I I had to build like what we could call maybe an infrastructure pipeline or flywheel of success, so to say, right? So you yeah. have click uh -huh. data and then you train the model, you test and then you validate and so on and so forth. Uh, validate with the users, maybe A/B test. It was it was awesome. I built it entirely on your on your repo, and I even oh, I that's think cool. sent some uh, was it the PR or issue that I created? But anyway, I'm sure. Yeah, it, yeah. It seems like uh, Dimitri, you contribute a lot to like. I know you contribute a lot to Cupid too. I know you and Eric are constantly huddling on you know Cupid and trying to keep it keep it going. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and and I mean that's thanks to your curiosity that you created it. You you kind of saw the the niche and fit for it. Uh, but also uh, when I came across it, I mean it was very uh, straightforward to start using it. Uh, and and of course it was also a learning experience. But now every time I I join let's say a new new gig, you know, previously silo AI with with a large client, you know, web scale search, I brought it in. I said there is no other tool that I know. We should not yeah. this time. just try this, and then at TomTom, Tom, right, at TomTom Tom right now as well, we have it. Oh, that's uh, awesome! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cupid has a funny origin story where, um, and in sort of like dovetails with my story. But for a long time, open source connections, and I think this is true of a lot of places in the early 2010s, it was pretty easy to build. You, we would build these beautiful search apps and that would be part of our uh, our consulting as we built these search apps and they would be beautiful and they look pretty. 
but then only at the very end would someone type in a search and you would see, oh, wait, these results don't make any sense. And then like people panic and they want to fix it. They're about to go to market. They can't release like this. And they realize oh, the search engine isn't some magic black box. It's actually this thing that we have to configure and tune and stuff. And so uh, Cupid actually started because, um, and there's a old Lucene Revolution video that talks about this, but John Berryman, my coworker at the time, and I would go to uh, our client also in Charlottesville Silverchair, and we were helping them develop these search applications. And uh, as like they would tune, like constantly we would go back every week and try to fix something. And then we would end up breaking something else. So I finally got kind of tired of it. And I just sat there and built like a, at the time, a Python Flask app that was just, let's show these search results and like just label them as good or bad. And so we don't have to keep going backwards on, on our quality. And he was, I was literally creating the app while he was sitting there, like trying to tune search with, uh, with our client, um, Rena Morse uh, at Silverchair. So it was kind of like hacked together in an hour and then we started using it. This is so cool. And, and I mean, for me, Cupid, uh, I mean, this topic of, uh, quality assurance and search is big, I think. Right. And maybe undervalued. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, like, it is. Yeah, totally. But, but, you know, like at AlphaSense, for example, I had access to uh, people who used to be financial analysts or they uh, deeply understand, you know, content. And it's so important to understand content like broker totally. search versus, you know, sell side versus buy side. What is it? What is this? You know, what people are looking there for? And, um, and I remember one of the guys uh, on that product team, he said, well, this is fantastic. Now I can explain to you what I need in terms of relevancy without getting into the weeds of your algorithm. And you then totally. go and, and get there, right? So I mean, that's, totally, that's fantastic. And and I remember like uh, at web scale search, we we got stuck a little bit like optimizing our K KPI metrics. Like one of them is click through rate, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I remember when I onboarded Cupid, we generated literally seventy Jira tickets as a result of mm -hmm. analyzing first annotating rating the queries and then an analyzing what went wrong there, right? And mm -hmm. probably major, like half of this at least was data related issues, which you would think, hey, this is stupid. This is about relevancy, not about data. But it oh is. yeah, you find that stuff all the time. Yeah, we we would um, we kind of had this model at Open Source Connections that worked well, where, you know, you you come in as a consultant, and you're trying to. We would we started consulting in the search relevance space ex exclusively, and we would come in and instead of sometimes you know it's a very data-driven process and it needs to be but on the other times it's like just jumping in let's start with 12 queries and let's label what's what the good results are and improve those and then uh we would kind of go through these sprints of okay let's take the next 12 queries let's take the next 12 queries and you just constantly like gradually expand the envelope of what you're tuning um, and that actually worked really well as a practice for improving relevancy without having to spend like sometimes, you know, the, you know, places don't necessarily have months to spend bootstrapping like a click stream pipeline and understanding how the clicks and all the biases and things in that, uh, or, you know, and so it's just a really straightforward way to get started on the problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if you could imagine this, but when I was consult, I had like a breather two months between, uh, you know, that client and TomTom. Tom. So I, I consulted a few startups, uh, one of them in the US. And so they look at you as a wizard, you know, you come in and they think you can do magic. And I said, okay, yeah. well, maybe I can, but I will not tell you. <laughs> so no doubt um, in front of you. Uh, so I came there and I said, hey, how are you doing QA? And they, they showed me this massive Excel with colored mm -hmm, legend mm -hmm. and like whatnot and i said well this is cool but i think it's not repeatable and they said yeah mm -hmm. it's a big pain point i said let's do something better something else and i introduced cupid it took probably a couple months then i lost touch with that startup so i switched to consulting others they didn't reach out then i reached out and i said hey what's the status and they said you will be surprised but we have moved the, the whole qa process to cupid i was like wow <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah this is, That's this, awesome. is that, this is that touch and feeling of what you have created for your 
use cases worked for someone else's yeah. use case. Isn't it amazing yeah. feeling? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's it's funny how that works. You you know, if you solve your own problem really well, you know there's probably other people out there that are like you that have the same problem and appreciate that perspective on on the problem. So um, so yeah, I, I think that's that's kind of a, a truism is like don't worry about solving a if you have a if you have a need if you have a need solve the problem for yourself as as the most important audience and it will sort of naturally find the people like you who have the exact same problem yeah fantastic and now you are at shopify past yeah um so how do you structure your work there this is my how part in the podcast as well um you're building your your, your product is relevancy in many ways mm -hmm. right uh, and maybe performance of the search engine because there are, there are trade-offs. Yeah. So how do you structure the whole process, experimentation, evaluation? Is there anything you could share? I understand that there could be some private things you don't want to share. Oh, sure. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. So for, for context, uh, our team works on the relevancy of all of the Shopify storefronts, so all the little shops out there. And um, that's a really interesting process because you could imagine... Um, the impact there is very variable per shop. Um, and we don't, of course, we don't want to like tank someone's sales, but at the same time, if we see something doing well, uh, generally, then we, you know, we want to promote it. So our process there, it's, it's very different than um, in the past. I've worked on, you know, you work on one search engine, you might work on one Shopify store, so to speak. And at Shopify, the challenge is there are hundreds of thousands, millions of little, you know, shops that use Shopify search. And how do you how do you find an algorithm or algorithms that support those uh, the you know what's going to work well for every possible e-commerce use case? Like in some cases, of course, there's a lot of apparel on Shopify. There's a lot of uh, there's a you know all kinds of things. People make up businesses on Shopify. Shopify is wants to very much support creators. How do people even search? And what do they expect when they search on these stores? Mm -hmm. um, so the the good thing is when I started at Shopify, there was already uh, some amount of you know data flowing through in terms of like knowing what people are clicking on and stuff. So I was able to pretty early on start developing um, a click model. So a click model is something that looks at how users click on results and sort of like in aggregate gives a search result, a probability of relevance uh, for a given query. So if we notice that people skip over a certain product a lot when they search for shoes, maybe for some reason the shoe search shows socks at the top, we know those socks are probably not relevant. Uh, and we know that whatever they're clicking on below that are very likely relevant. And so we we can we started, you know, the good thing at Shopify, we kind of were able to start using that as like a test set. And then um, of course, tooling is very key to my heart. So like one thing that we've done at Shopify is we built a, a large tool, tool chain, um, we we sort of to do offline experiments called uh, called boogie using that data, uh, and it's about what you would expect from using something like Cupid. We can take this data, we can sort of see like did we improve things? Did things get worse with our ideas? Um, and then of course we release to A/B tests. We look at our normal conversion metrics and that kind of thing, and then uh, we do a lot of analysis of our A/B tests, and then we. We will graduate things to production. So at a super high level, that's that's nothing there. I don't think is that different than most places, other than you know we have the challenge of so many different shops and things that we have to sort of solve for. I mean, this sounds so fantastic. It's like almost fixing uh, or improving search for the entire e-commerce, right? And maybe even be yeah, that's that's part of the challenge and the draw. And one of the reasons you know I'm at Shopify is just because it's it's for. You, there are people on Shopify who sell 100,000 products. There are people who sell one product, right? And there are it really, there are stores that you use that you may not realize are Shopify stores. And then there are stores that are very clearly like Shopify at the end. So 
that you know shopify in the url or at the, in the footer and that kind of thing but some you know your local i think my local running shop shout out to ragged mountain running uh uses shopify and then there's a place that you know at the farmer's market and a lot of those places use shopify but then there's also like larger larger brands that use shopify yeah that's amazing i've uh seen you recently posted was it on linkedin this uh paper was it from google saying mm -hmm. that search abandonment costs us retail uh 30 uh, 300 billion uh dollars annually uh so it, it's like massive massive opportunity for search um companies you know consultancies and so on totally but wh why do you think this is still the case regardless of all the efforts of our like vast search community is it it's is a it to say really that, good question is it to say that community is too small and there is like potential to grow it and add companies and so on or is there something fundamental that you know still needs to be tackled i think it's um it reminds me a lot of how where the search space and not just the search space but adjacent things like recommendations or any i would say like surface on a let's say a website or a product or an app that like is algorithmic in some way uh, that's just a, it feels like from how people build products, it's just fundamentally a, a, a nascent space. So uh, it reminds me of early in my career when I was a software developer and I worked at a couple of software companies, maybe because I was a CE developer that fund, that really were hardware companies and people at management levels were used to running hardware companies and but more and more, the value was delivered through software. And they didn't necessarily understand how to manage software. So, you know, hardware, you might have these very upfront, you know, classically waterfall kinds of development processes. And then software, you know, in the early 2000s, we learned about agile and then it was good to be iterative and, and these things. And it's okay, you know, fail fast. And we can always, unlike hardware with software, we can hit the undo button. And so it's a very different practice and a very different style of leadership, I think. And I think the same thing is becoming true of these data products, like algorithmic data products like search, where um, sure, at the implementation level, in our at our level, you see a lot of people who really, we understand the problem. We understand it's very experimental. It's even more experimental than like how software you can ship something and you can undo something if you need to. It's actually like extremely experimental where every week you're shipping something new and you're always looking at metrics and A-B tests and everything. And every week you make a completely different product bet and you go in a different direction. Honestly, I think one reason that uh, one reason that that this is a problem is that organizations structured to ship classic software aren't necessarily well suited to ship like these data products. Um, and, uh, you, I gave a talk at, at MyC's, uh, you know, the, the e-commerce search conference in Charlottesville in April about how at Shopify, one of the things that we do to try to help with this problem is really make engineering and data like work hand in hand, because many organizations, they're very siloed from each other. And that can be a really big challenge because as you make these decisions, like day to day, like. I'm implementing something in my search. Do I go, do I, you know, as I'm writing lines of code, do I go to the left or do I go to the right? Do I try boosting this or implement this algorithm? Well, it might make things a little bit slower, a little bit faster. And like those really intricate decisions, you kind of need both sides of the data and engineering brain to, to, to do those. And I only think a very, very small handful of companies, places like Google, maybe Meta, Facebook, like have really mastered this like blending of data and engineering. And I think this is a reason that most people, most other companies who have started to like, you know, have finally mastered software engineering, haven't quite come up like from a leadership and beyond and product leadership, overcome the, the, the sort of like hump of, of how do we think about data products? How do we manage things that are experimental and aren't like, you know, agile projects that are gonna take a couple months to complete that we have a very clear beginning, middle and end to.
Yeah, exactly. It's like beautifully put. Like it's not like a Toyota, you know, pipeline where you could say, yeah, this is where we start. We put it all these materials in. Some people do something, and we fix some bugs, and off we go. We mm -hmm. have a car. But like there is no like definition of done in some sense, right? Yeah, there's no definition of done. It's very much like uh, you're just constantly experimenting. It's not something that's visual, that it's like, oh, we're going to add this button to the UI and it's going to do these things. In some ways, you're not changing. You're always, you're like rarely changing the UI. You're like mixing up search results and how they come up. Um, there may be UI elements to it, like, oh, we understand this query better. So we serve this UI, but it's extremely fuzzy and hard to like, I one of the biggest challenges I have actually, you know, and I've had this in consulting and, you know, continue to have a shop device. How do you coach stakeholders to understand what you even do? Um, the plus side is it's very much a, it's very much like, oh, it's a very tied to, you know, we're going to make more money. On the other hand, it's like not clearly like a project, so to speak, in a traditional sense. It's a, it's a constant cycle of experimentation and optimization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and it requires like a different uh, discipline and like rigor and uh, mm -hmm. really even like at TomTom, for example, I work uh, in a relevancy team, search, search relevancy. I, I own the ML component or try to. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but the thing is that I was amazed by by the team saying, hey, I'm running this A-B test and they compute a bunch of metrics, some like confidence intervals, P values, and they say, yeah, I feel like this is a good change in the algorithm, but it's not proving to be. Like when we have mm -hmm. split our traffic A, B, 50, 50, just doesn't work after two weeks. We have to kill it. And that's mm -hmm. like, you need to go through that rigor. If you say, just for the moment, you, you doubt and you say, no, I love this change. I'm going to push it forward. It's not going to mm -hmm. harm. You lost. Like you mm -hmm. cannot do this, right? It requires everyone to be a scientist too. And um, I think traditional, I think there is like traditional product and other kinds of leadership that is very, can be very opinion driven or have a strong vision. And I don't think there's a, there, I think there's still tons of room for that because at the end of the day, you need, um, you need a strong hypothesis. And often what you're AB testing is within the context of a larger strategy. Um, like, you know, we're, we think we'll get traction if we go in this direction, but you have to like, you have to really in, bring science to everyone has to be a scientist. And it's not as often an A-B test too, is not as simple as like, it was a clear winner or loser. It sometimes is a winner in some ways where it's like, it's a winner in this dimension, a loser in this other dimension. And then like, can we go after and slice and dice the data to really understand what happened? Uh, it's, it's not, it's not a, often not like a cut and dry story. And so like trying to understand the data to even know how to tell the story requires a lot of humility. I think if you're a leader to say like, okay, it's more important, like what I learned than like my big idea being, being the winner of, you know, being the clear like thing that won. So I get all the credit and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is amazing. I, I wanted to, I'm, I'm actually rereading your book uh, here. I'm a big uh -oh. fan. And, and once we meet, uh, you, you give me the autograph, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and John Berryman as well. I think I saw you actually in person, uh, Lucine Revolution 2013. You were on stage. Oh, okay. In, it was in Dublin. Do you remember being in Dublin? If you did, Yeah, you yeah, yeah. That was fun. Yeah. I remember they had this huge rugby stadium. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This was the, uh, no, we're coming back to. I think I talked about Cupid there. I think my uh, colleague from Silverchair Arena came out and we talked about Cupid. Yes. Uh, and, and I and I got blessing uh, for Luke from uh, Andre Beletsky there. I said, would you be okay if I continue? Because he didn't have time. And he said, yes, 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 please, please. Oh, cool. And, and then later it ended up being part of Lucene and earned a Lucene committer to Tomoko Uchida, uh, who is now driving massive changes there on Jira and- Oh, uh, awesome. Jira. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, I've seen his name a lot. Yeah. Yes. Um, fantastic. Um, and, and in this book, why, why I brought it up, I was just reading one of the first chapters where you so beautifully said, 
analysis. So let's say in Lucene lingo, how you process the input text. Yeah. Right? Analysis shouldn't map to uh, words to tokens. It should map meaning and user intent to tokens. Yeah. I yeah. mean, this is amazingly put, and you go there um, later explaining how you uh, balance the precision versus recall as you do modifications to the analysis chain, you know, whether you're stemming or not and stuff like that. Uh, but it's not like many people even view it that way, I think. Not that I viewed it that way. I was always like, yeah, what should I tweak to make it findable? <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a related topic on this front, you know, uh, uh, query and content understanding. Mm -hmm. how, how how does this thing connect in your mind? Yeah, I think so. So first of all, I think it's funny how the work that we do shapes uh, sort of like how we do certain work shapes our perspective on things. Because I think uh, when I was you know writing that book and sort of like my early part of my relevance career. At open source connections and uh, this still happens like you kind of get brought to a client and it's like okay we have we have this app over here or we have this indexing pipeline you just work within this box that is the search engine and so i became quite adept at like how can i hack the analyzers and the query and everything to be really to do like all the crazy things i want to do like and really could I take in a taxonomy and sort of map to a, a conceptual understanding of, of the language, not just a, not just like the words themselves, you know, people think about analyzers, they think about stemming and they think about lower casing, but more and more it was like, oh, I only, I can only work within this box that is a search engine and whether it becomes like plugins or whatever, how can I, how can I massage the text coming in and the queries coming in so that they they map to each other and so um in that in that context it's it's like uh you know people you may have heard conway's law which is like you end up shipping your org chart like how you structure your projects is very much tied to the organizational structure of how you sort of uh of, of how you do things and so the consultant slash relevance team it really only works in the box that is the search engine and makes the magic thing magic more magical. Um, and so how it's, when I think about that, often it's sort of similar to how people think about relational databases. You're creating an, uh, a structure of a database to answer certain questions. In the same way, using analysis and how you create fields, you're sort of like structuring an index or a view of some documents to answer these natural language queries that come in. And so everything is sort of like thinking about massaging this database to really to really get to that and to rank results in a way that sort of like gets closer to the questions that users are answering. Um, and a, a really concrete example of that is, uh, you know, I think this comes up a lot in that actually this is my, one of my earliest search projects was if you take some, let's say some medical knowledge into a, your indexing like questions or medical articles and you have a, there are taxonomies out there that are like mesh is one medical subject headings that say like, okay, this article is an article about, um, uh, let's say something in the cardiovascular system that has to do with the heart and it has to do with like the left ventricle. So you, that's a taxonomy, it's hierarchy. And um, if I can index that and I can index that taxonomy in a certain way so that if someone, if I take a query, I also map the query to something in that taxonomy, let's say cardiovascular system, heart, right ventricle, if I can engineer the similarity in the search engine so that it uh, it kind of uses the analysis to be like, oh, it has so many taxonomy nodes similar, that makes it more relevant, but maybe it has one or two dissimilar that makes it a little less relevant. If I can sort of like zero in on, a, on, on that, uh, then I'm really getting closer to sort of meaning than I am to, uh, you know, whether 
it's it's like a, a stemmed version of this word or not. Um, and you can create tokenization pipelines that take terms like, let's say, a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, and sort of like uses synonyms and other things to say, oh, it's actually this part in this taxonomy. Uh, and therefore, you know, we, we, we sort of expand it to these taxonomy tokens. And uh, same thing at index time. And so I got very adept at sort of massaging data in that way. But I think like when you take a step back and you think about if you have access to the full indexing pipeline, as most teams do, and you have access to the full query API and everything, um, really you're doing the same exact thing. You're sort of like massaging content as it's come in, comes in. And in some ways you have more tools if you can do it before it gets to the search engine. And the same thing with queries, you might have some ability to apply an NLP model or do some kind of entity recognition before it comes in. So philosophically, you're really doing the same thing. You're trying to map, um, it, you're sort of at one side, you're mapping documents to queries. And on the other side, you're mapping query to sort of the document structure. And you're trying to map those two together in a way that creates a ranking function that, that does what you would want it to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it was Daniel Tankelang who summarized his 20 years experience as comparing sets of documents, right? So like, is this set of documents better than the other? And then mm -hmm. everything else comes as input, you know, was it query understanding? Was it content understanding? Whatever. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's uh, all of these things come together and the search engine is kind of like the core driver and you're like massaging this similarity engine to to make that quote unquote cosine similarity what you want it to be. Yeah, I, I've recently ran uh, across one case. Uh, so in map search, you could think, oh, what, what people do type there? Well, they do type addresses, they type um, coordinates. Um, they also type uh, questions. They can mm -hmm. say, how do I, where do I go hiking here? You know, in this area, stuff like that. Not something mm -hmm. we can handle right now, but maybe in the future we will. And the case was um, there was a, a company a search with company name. So right, we we support points of interest search POI, and our search engine focused on. So you have a, a meaningful part of the company name. I don't remember something like white mice something, and mm -hmm. then it had like less meaningful parts like limited <laughs> uh, South Africa. You know things that would repeat across a number of company names. Mm. And our search engine, because you 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 have the feature of min should max, right? It 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 focused actually on less meaningful components, and so yeah. it bumped some uh, over overlap higher just because how TFIDF by the way works. It's also a lot of work there going into understanding why does this TF equal to this number? I need to figure mm. out the whole idea, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and I was like. So I went on Twitter and I tweeted, like, I came across another use case where maybe vector search could help because mm -hmm. it, it would actually focus on the meaningful part, hopefully, because you have the attention uh, mechanism in, in the transformer models, right? Like BERT and others. So presumably mm -hmm. it would focus only on the right part and it would find it. Do, do you think Do you think this was a moment of despair or do you believe in this? Uh, I, I, I mean, I do believe in it to some extent, like I totally believe that's a valid thing. I also think that like sometimes the document frequency itself is really interesting because it's like, it gets at the idea of, of specificity in the query. And so if you search for something and it's just like the document frequency is sometimes a poor measure of specificity because it's, uh, it's not the, like. It's actually, you know, just because something is rare in the corpus doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually more specific to the user's intent. And, and some cases like that is just like uh, uh, thinking of when, when we would do, uh, I, we did a project for O'Reilly Media to kind of help with a project similar to Safari Books Online that people might be familiar with. And people don't like, if people search, um, JavaScript or book JavaScript books. <clears throat> it just so happens that just how titles are written. If you write a book on on uh, React, 
you're not going to put JavaScript in the title, but React is conceptually, you know, about JavaScript. And so uh, what's really interesting is like, I, you know, you type JavaScript books, React might be a good, great, a React book might be a great JavaScript book, but you have to un understand React in the context of this broader concept of JavaScript, even though that exact term isn't put in title. So uh, this concept of term specificity is really useful, but it's often like uh, the, the way we get at it with document frequency can be, can be really invalid, you know, not great. And to your point about like the attention mechanism, that's, that's really, that's really interesting because um, yeah, I sort of, I could see like conceptually how, uh, how that can really like tie it. You sort of like zero in on the concepts that are most important to a, to a document. And one challenge with like, one of the reasons I think BERT is so found like transformative is traditionally like for years and years, even going back to the early 2000s with like latent semantic analysis and the, these things. And, and then we had word to vec eventually. These sort of like techniques, uh, they're really great for like, in some ways like increasing recall or getting at like a rough semantic sense of, of what's, what's uh, you know, what's there. But when you, at the end of the day, it's like not helping me really get at the higher precision kind of component of search uh, that really like traditional search engines thrive at and still are really good at. Like you have like, you know that this is a shoe. I don't need to see socks, just show me the shoes. This is a shoe. Uh, and you don't have that like fuzziness that you get in a dense vector representation where everything is kind of compressed down and fuzzy. Uh, but what BERT and those kinds of things really do with the attention mechanism, I think it's really like turning that on its head where it's like, oh, actually there are these parts that uh, we could get at where it's like the precision of these related concepts. It's like, we know that, um, we know that the A, the most important part of this document is this part that talks about JavaScript or it's, you know, the JavaScriptiness about it. And, and when we search for that, we can kind of zero in on, on that uh, dimension of it, as opposed to being a fuzzy concept of, um, of, you know, programming languages and JavaScript, if that makes sense. I feel like it's like zeroing in on like what makes this, this thing precisely interesting as opposed to traditional dense vector representations, which have been more fuzzy and cast to find cat, a, a five wide net kind of thing and more focused on recall. Yeah, exactly. I think in, in, you, you've written a, a nice paper with OSC, what problem does BERT hope to solve for search in 2019, end of 2019? Mm -hmm. And you really well compared their um, inverted index sparse search method with uh, word to vec and then you basically allude to the fact that BERT probably gets the aboutness of the document uh, better than uh, word to vec or TF-IDF, right? Mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm. because in word to vec you essentially have like a, a window that you slide through. And yeah. To your early example, if this book React never happens to be near JavaScript because everyone knows it's JavaScript, right? Uh, then you will never find it using using word to vec or maybe it will be too distant. But with BERT, it tries to embed the whole document, right? Or like, you know, chunks of it averaged and so on. So it might. Yeah. Be... And, and you have to do like, if you were to use word to vec you'd have to like sort of implement your own attention mechanism in a way. You'd be like, uh, okay, what parts of the document are, okay, first I've got to throw out a bunch of front matter and and end matter and, and junk. And like with word to vec you'd have to somehow engineer to like, okay, I'm gonna look at these paragraphs and uh, maybe I need to focus in on these ones more and throw away some other ones. Uh, and you don't miss it. The aboutness of that gets really blended. Whereas the amazing thing, yeah, you're right. The amazing thing about like, about BERT is how its ability to really zero in on the aboutness of like where uh, each, each token position it's not just like the paragraph has you know where the document has an embedding each token position has an embedding so it's like if i take a question i can really zero in on like oh this is the part of this article 
that is most similar to this. You still get challenges with like the fuzziness of dense vector and it's, you know, maybe not precisely the words you're looking for, but just the fact like that's just mind boggling that each token position of a book might be an embedding. I mean, it's a bear, it can be a beast to, to manage and deal with, but it's, it could be a really powerful concept. Yeah, absolutely. And plus it's a must, must model, right? So it can predict what should be the, the token in that masked out position. Mm -hmm. which, and then it can actually predict entire sentences. I think there was one of the side uh, yeah. effects of it, right? So it could become generated. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And so today, as we roll into this, um, you you follow up on this trend of uh, sparse versus dense. You know, I think a lot of discussion is still going uh, around how dense will enter the sparse search world uh, yeah. at larger yeah. scale. So how do you feel about this? And of course, there is hybrid search as well. Uh, Probably it's a, a hot to... space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know there's a lot of open source projects. There's like Milvis, there's companies like Pinecone, uh, there's Qdrent. There are all um, all of these systems that are doing dense vector retrieval. And it's also just like a fun problem if you were in search for a while to think about approximate nearest neighbors and like how you solve that. And I know for a long time, it's been sort of, you know, a side project of a lot of people. I know for you, Dimitri and Max, you guys had had a lot of fun in the billion vector challenge. Um, yeah. It's it you you the first thing to a a ask is like why do we need these extra databases? And it's interesting to think about because you're thinking like I we just talked about why can't we you know we can match to map tokens to meaning and that kind of thing you know or why you know and why can't we do that? Why can't we just apply the same techniques to the dense world? Why can't we use a traditional search engine? And if you think about it, what what you're they're very in some ways they're very the data structures underneath of them are optimized. It's like yes, you you're both in both cases you're sort of like mapping query meaning to document meaning. Like fundamentally, the task is the same. But the data structures that you would use for a dense system where everything is clustered into like 200 and maybe 256 or 768 or whatever dimensions are very different than a sparse index where, you know, you have, and it's something like a Elasticsearch, like a Lucene traditional index, really it's a, it's a, the dimensionality is way, way, way higher. So it's like, you know, you could expect hundreds of thousands of words. Each, each word is its own dimension. And if you think about that, like you're gonna have situations where, you know, words follow zip, Zip's law, Zip's law, which is, you know, the occur in English, the occurs in every word. Uh, and you get gradually, gradually falls right off a cliff. And then you get like cat occurs in 1% of documents. And then you go keep going and you get like specific terminology, like, feline occurs in 0.1% and it really falls off a cliff. And so these sparse vector indices are really optimized for that use case of like, I have a, I have a term and it basically points at a very small handful of documents that contain that term. And I can do that lookup very quickly. I can fetch those, I can score those, and then I can sort of like get, uh, get a, get a score. Whereas what's interesting about the dense vector case is it's more like I go in with sparse vector, I go in with a single term and I get like, or maybe two or three terms. I look up in this giant data structure and I get this, this by looking up and I can get like the, I can get the handle to all the things that match that and I can sort those and get them back. With dense vector, the query isn't two or three terms, it's some value in a larger 256 or more dimension vector. So off the bat right there is like, that's a large 256 terms in a, in a traditional search engine would be a large query. And really you're looking up in a, in a index that is itself that dimensionality, much smaller dimensionality where every document has some amount of value for each, each dimension. 
So it's not like cat where it occurs in three things. It's like all billion documents have some level of, if cat was one of the dimensions, some level of catness. And if you, th you just think about the, the, how you would build a data structure, it'd be a very different thing. Um, and that's why uh, that's why they, people build these you know completely different data structures and why doing nearest neighbors uh, on this large scale of data is very important because you do want to get like some some sense of like similar conceptual meaning in this in this compressed vector space. But uh, that in and of itself kind of gets at the pros and cons of each because if you get this sort of like compressed representation, you don't specifically have the word cat or even direct necessarily direct synonyms of cat that you've created, you have like a rough statistical sense of like catness or animalness that you're kind of clustering together. You've lost it by compressing to smaller dimensions. You've lost some precision just by definition, but you've sort of expanded the net of what you might bring in. Uh, so that's like a pro and a con of the new dense vector representation. Whereas continuing to use a sparse vector representation, it's a much more precisely managed lookup. And so they, there's not some future where you throw away one or you throw away the other. More and more, the reality is like hybrid retrieval where you're using both data structures to serve uh, search results to give people like some kind of relevant results and in a mix of both perspectives of like expanding the meaning to maybe mean other things or you no know, staying in this more precise world of sparse specter meaning or sparser meaning. Yeah, it's amazing how you put it. Like it struck me uh, how in a simple way you can explain complex things. I mean, the sparse vector, yeah, you said hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, terms in your term dictionary. When I worked at AlphaSense, I once counted, we had a billion in, in mm. one, in, because you, you feed like, I don't know, millions and millions of documents and, and they do vary quite a lot. Of mm -hmm. course, there is some overlap, like financial, mm -hmm. legal, like revenue, right, w would occur everywhere. But then as they describe different verticals in the industry, you know, healthcare versus, I don't know, pure finance, banking, um, investment firms and stuff, they they have different lingo there. And um, and that's amazing, like how you put it, right? So if I had a vector, let's say billion size, right? Now I have uh, what? I have much less, right? So I have like 768 mm -hmm. dimensions, maybe 1,024. I heard the recently um, one committer in, in Elasticsearch is trying to push Lucene to upgrade to 2048 or something. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and I didn't see that. That's that's amazing. Yeah. yeah I think it was Maya Sharipa. Uh, so yeah, and, uh, th this is amazing, but I guess you're right. And also there is another thing that um, comes to mind. We had a, a podcast with Yuri Malkov, who is the creator of one of the most popular um, ANN algorithms, mm -hmm. HNSW, hierarchical, navigable, small world graph. And mm -hmm. when I ask him this question, so let's say you have this geometrical search, right? Similarity search. And in, in the case of e-commerce, you also want to have filters. So you want to say, I want to red shoes, you know, this size in stock and so on. And and he, he surprisingly, he said, this contradicts uh, contradict the to each other so so much that I cannot even imagine creating a generic algorithm that will cover this case, mm. because essentially he said it could quickly degrade to traversing the whole space of points, because as you said, you know aboutness as a dimension, you also have these filters as a dimension, right? You could say yeah, cluster these points on color, cluster these points on size. Yeah, yeah. Imagine doing this up front. I mean, this is not a generic solution. And and he was he was just blunt and saying this is not possible. I don't see how you could do this. And yet, uh, the vector databases claim that they have done it. Uh, and and yes, you can go and at scale. Uh, but I, I I sense that there is some some truth hidden, maybe potentially <laughs> there, you know, some edge cases where it doesn't work, or maybe it goes over a second and it's acceptable. I don't know. But how do you feel? Yeah, about this? I, I mean, it feels a bit like overcomplicating a solved problem. It feels like we've 
I sort of I suspect that we'll be in a world of of sort of hybrid more hybrid retrieval where you're using a traditional filter for those kinds of things. Because I think like I feel like we dense retrieval is the missing piece of most people's search systems. Uh, if not for anything, then just like, I think like first pass, like often it was like case for a long time that people would would do uh, like first pass, like BM25 scoring, and then like maybe apply some learning to rank algorithm. I sort of feel like that's going to flip to be, it could flip to be like, first I'm going to get this dense vector candidate list because it's compressed. It's like, it's actually more recall oriented. And then I'm going to use sparse vector techniques to filter re-rank and these kinds of things. But I also think like just for speed and ops, like one thing that's, you know, it's just a practical concern is like their solar elastic search have such huge install bases and a huge practitioner people who know how to scale them. And I think with new uh, dense vector techniques, I'm not sure people are going to like completely throw out their Elasticsearch or Solar install just to have this new functionality. And in fact, you know, as Elasticsearch and Solar sort of adopt more of these things, I think more and more people are going to say, like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to use this in addition to my Elasticsearch or Solar. So I sort of feel like we'll end up in this world where, where yeah, Elasticsearch and Solar don't give us as nice of a set of feature features for that, but it already works pretty well for 80% of what we do anyway, and we just kind of want to tack on this extra bit. So that feels more of a ex my expectation of what the future would be than, than we'll like throw out the existing systems and adopt something new. Yeah, this is very interesting opinion. Of course, uh, not downplaying all these players that you mentioned. Uh, I have a mm -hmm. blog about it as well. Seven databases exist today, and few neural um, net network. Uh, no neural uh, frameworks like Gina and Haystack, which yeah. is on top mm -hmm. of these of these databases. But I agree. Like I think the future might be in flexibility. That okay, if I'm already with Solar, why don't I just use the uh, you know ANN plugin and try my luck? maybe just um, wet my toes, so so to say, right? I don't want to jump to the entirely new world of new database that I don't have uh, experience with. But if but if you haven't had that set up, you're a startup, let's say. I know some startups, uh, when they when they want to go that direction with neural search, they, they do consider Vespa or VV8 or Pinecone, you know. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that might be a different use case as well, by the way. This is entirely new big topic but it's not only search right search is still being figured out and some companies do it but then you also have uh, machine learning pipelines like recommender systems oh totally so yeah that's a great use case so it's not like for search of, of course like you have this huge install base and stuff so i mean especially you know for established companies like shopify or whoever else uh but you're absolutely right there is there is a lot of opportunity for for this at um in so many places like pure question answering applications or um places where you know you're using it as a back-end component to do some kind of inference for recommendation systems i think it's a fantastic i think it's a fantastic thing and i i do i do think like more and more a, a bigger practice will evolve to scaling these things out and understanding them from an operational perspective so I, yeah, I definitely think it's an interesting landscape to watch. And I think like, I think the the counter, the other counter argument to what I said is like, like their solar and elastic search are established for their use cases, but the sort of, like I was saying before, the sort of like world of building these search-like or data-driven surfaces or personalization-driven surfaces it's just wide open. Like I look at my phone, I have the limited screen real estate. It needs to show me something relevant for me or relevant to, uh, you know, I think, you know, Peloton, for example, Peloton, the fitness app, I want to do a workout. It's going to, I'm going to go to the app. It's going to, it's not going to like 
it does have navigation, but it's also just like trying to show me something on the screen that's going to be relevant to me. So engage with it or Netflix or all of the UIs we use these days. They're not really like point and click. They're driven by some kind of smart algorithm. And it's not necessarily like a classic search use case where it's like point, click, filter, then search with relevance. So I do think the it's a wide open space. And honestly, I think it's a it's an underappreciated space. And I think it's a space that um, in some ways, if I was maybe if I was, you know, I'm just thinking of this now and I, I'm speak speaking completely out of uh, out of hand, but like if I was to advise like a pine cone or somebody, I might say like, let's, you know, stop talking about yourself as a vector database. Let's start talking about all of these ways that are really, you know, I think I, in my book, I talk about relevance oriented applications or like, I forget even like relevance driven enterprises. And I think like a lot of these applications are really sort of like completely sort of relevance oriented applications where it's really whether it's really personalization or recommendations, there are things that are about ranking something to a user for a given context or maybe for a given query or question. And I would focus on the universe of that stuff because I don't know if anyone's really speaking from a product perspective about how, what is the engine that drives that? And I think that could be a really exciting product or open source space or whatever to just really be in. This is a great advice. I might quote you on the upcoming keynote that I need to deliver at Haystack Berlin because I oh, think sure. this is a great, great thought uh, because in many ways, you know, one thing is that when people come back to me and they say, what's the difference between vector and neural search? And I'm like, uh, there's not much difference. It's like vector is probably mathematical stance and then neural yeah. is more like if you're a deep learning engineer or researcher. So you like to, yeah. to take it from that angle, right? Uh, but then you, you you put it so beautifully, like maybe if we focus too much on this technical level saying, you know, this is vector search, this is end. Yeah, totally. It's all, it's all sexy, you need to buy it. Uh, and, and we don't focus on like use cases and how things enough, I think enough, uh, and how this could complement each other. You know, it's not like vector search is trying to kick out sparse search. It's not going to happen, by the way. You know, the phrase search is not supported in vector search. Maybe it will be, but it's not right now. You cannot just there, say there's that. also there's yeah. also a set of problems that are, I mean, to this day, people use tree-based models for I'm gonna mix some kind of similarity with some kind of statistic about my data. You know, I think like tabular data, so to speak, has consistently been dominated by tree-based models, which is a completely different thing from deep learning and neural search. So, and those things integrate pretty well with like the learning to rank plugins in Solar and Elasticsearch, um, where you can plug in a vector similarity into that kind of tree-based model, uh, but the opposite isn't necessarily true. This is very interesting. So Doug, like we spoke a lot about, uh, and I'm sure we could sp speak more about how to engineer a search engine, you know, let's say if you're a startup, you don't have clicks, right? You you don't have uh, feedback from your users, maybe necessarily in that mm -hmm. form. Um, you can engineer, uh, now you have uh, dense search, you, you, you can still engineer by tweaking analysis chains and then crafting synonym dictionaries. Uh, but once you are over that uh, launch, you know, and you gathered that data, natural move is to start looking into something like learning to rank. Mm -hmm. And you you spoke a lot uh, about that. Um, I was just quickly googling. You know, you you spoke at um, I believe uh, uh, Berlin Buzzwords uh, Haystack. You spoke mm -hmm. somewhere in San Francisco Bay Area, uh, like how to turn you know ranking uh, into a ML problem, machine learning problem. Mm -hmm. You also spoke about Bayesian uh, well Optimate, methods yeah. optimization. Yeah. And then there is also, I've recently learned, well, not that recently, I think it was last uh, Haystack uh, or maybe the, the, the previous before that, learning to boost. Um, how do these methods come together? Wh where do you start for those who maybe haven't have only heard about it, but they didn't try it yet? And uh, do you also think maybe a connected question, do you think that we will marry, you know, the dense retrieval signals with learning to rank um, in some way. Does it make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I think a lot of companies, they think um, it's easy to go into the learning to rank process thinking that I'm going to, this is, you know, knock on wood, it's easy. I have a, a model. I am going to train this model with my clicks and everything and, and search will magically get better. What's interesting is if you go back to Haystack talks about learning to rank, and other conference talks where the number one place people get stuck and they spend their energy is on the training data, less so the model, the features and all of that stuff. And um, if you think about it, it makes sense because uh, one of the biggest problems with search training data is it's just horribly biased towards whatever the old algorithm is. You're always clicking on, you, people are always clicking on what the old algorithm showed them regardless of, you know, if it was good or not, um, there are, it's getting some clicks and the stuff that might be amazing, but it's on the 10th page is never getting clicks. So how do you optimize search in that context? And it sort of doesn't matter what model you use or what feature you use until you get like really well-labeled training data, you can't really make much progress. Um, so what you can do to get started on it is at a minimum, okay, we know that it's the training data is not perfect, but if we just look at like the top N, the top 10 or so, of what's actually getting clicks, we might be able to start to learn some stuff there about like what differentiates them. So you might start to think, you could think about this as um, the learning to rank is, there are many ways of learning to rank, but if we just start to think about it as a classification problem within the context of, these, uh, these results are that we do have click data on what's differentiating them, like getting being seen with lots of impressions and no clicks and lots of th and things with lots of clicks. Mm -hmm. And you start to see the features that separate those. Um, and then you sort of like know, at least you're knowing like within the context of your search filter bubble, what's sort of like differentiating relevant and irrelevant. And you can kind of use that to rank um, but at some point you do need to realize that like, I am working within this filter bubble of my original algorithm and all I'm doing is sort of tweaking up a few things and tweaking down a few things. How do I bust that filter bubble and get different kinds of potential relevant results in front of users to sort of like see whether or not they'll click or not. Um, and that's, that's really like sets, you know, that's really probably the big, big challenge that people have with, I mean, honestly, not just learning to rank, but any algorithmic search work that they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, when I was doing it using your hello LTR repo, I think I focused a lot on the mechanical aspects, like, okay, what is pair wise? What is list wise? I needed to read Lambda Mark papers to understand, mm -hmm. get into the weeds of the algos. But then I think I spent maybe too little time figuring out the data part and like head versus tail. Uh, I think Grant and yeah. likes to say torso as well. And I'm like, oh, torso, what's, yeah. what's that? So, so like, do you have any advice for those who are starting? Like, do they just need to be born data scientist? Or do you think that <laughs> <laughs> there is like it a tool set? Yeah, it helps, I guess, for those lucky ones. Uh, but like a tool set or a methodology or a book, or whatever. Like what? what yeah. What yeah. You... So um, I, I this is like a this is a big focus of AI powered search. Uh, a book I helped write with Trey Granger um, and Max Irwin, and then ML powered search, which is the uh, training I'm doing, um, because I I think I think like a lot of the focus these days is on cool things like dense vector retrieval, BERT, and these kinds of things. And to me, that's like taking out an old model and putting in a new model, but the problems outside of it to get the training data are still really hard. And there are a lot of techniques people can use. And I think sort of the thing people aren't talking about enough in, in this space is uh, active and reinforcement learning. And that's uh, what I talk about a lot in my book and my training. <clears throat> is um, this idea of, you know, how do we strategically explore new potential relevant search results for a query, but still maintaining 
exploiting the knowledge we do have because we don't want to completely just show people random results. And how do we play with that boundary a little bit in a strategic way and not just like, here's a bunch of results. Oh, and here's like a random one. Um, and there are processes out there that do that. And I'll, you know, one uh, one that's very near and dear to my heart, which is a very practical thing for people to learn about is what's called a, a Gaussian process. And a Gaussian process is just a different kind of um, regression. So it's the same way we're learning, uh, we're basically learning to rank. We're learning like, given a bunch of features like the title BM25 or maybe some dense vector similarity or some other, you know, the popularity of the document, we're still learning from our data what is, you know, what function of that and probably predicts relevance and what doesn't. But what's interesting about a Gaussian process is at any given point, it knows how certain it is in the prediction. So like obviously points that are in your training set, it's going to have high certainty that the, the variance, the sort of like the gal that's where the Gaussian comes in. The Gaussian um, distribution at that point is very small. It's very certain. When you go a little bit farther out from a point that you have information about, and it might sort of like try to connect the dots between that, that uh, observation and maybe one down here, but the uncertainty kind of grows and grows as it moves away from an existing observation. And that's interesting because what this model is doing is it's sort of like both predicting relevance for arbitrary points in the feature space. And it can do that because it can see patterns like, oh, it seems like there's a cluster of training data over here where it's like things in this realm are more relevant than things over here on the bottom left. Um, but when it's in between those data points is where the uncertainty really lies. And it can say, well, I'm going to, I think we should probe here. I think we should try to select a document to show the user to get more information on that is, uh, uh, we feel with a reasonable set of confidence is probably relevant, but we're not entirely sure because we haven't exactly observed that yet. Um, and that's really where you can both explore the training data and explore the feature space. So if you introduce a new feature into learning to rank, you can say like, oh, let me try different combinations of this. And then as you start to get out the general pattern, you can try things in between to really understand how that feature interacts with how, um, how users are interacting with data. So that's really why it's active learning. It's very much about like, the model itself, yes, you're, you're training a model, but the model itself can know its own gaps so that you can sort of like imagine as you're serving search results, you can go to this model and say, not only are you, what are you, I not only want what you're most certain about, I want like strategically where you want to explore and you can show those results to users too and start to gather clicks and information on that. And to me, that's a really exciting field of, of where search and information retrieval uh, and all of these fuzzy relevance-ish interfaces could go and, and do a lot of amazing work. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. It's like a mathematically driven way of expanding your click base, right? And, exactly. And it still, and it, and it still sounds uh, very experimental to me because nothing is given you only have, uh, from what you explained, if I understood it correctly, you know, it's like mm -hmm. it's still an experiment. We could run an A-B test. Is that how you would do it also? So like you you basically, your model is essentially a reflection of the data choice you made. And now you explained a Gaussian model to, to, to do that, right? And then you mm -hmm. run an A-B mm -hmm. test. Is that right? Yeah, you could do, you could set up lots of different ways of doing it. So you could be, um, you could have your A-B tests that are, that are going on. Um, Within those A-B tests, or let's say um, a classic A-B test is like, uh, if I search for shoe, I get ranking A or ranking B. Um, I can select, actually there's, there's a lot of creative ways you can do it, but sort of like a classic way of doing it might be to say in the third slot, I'm gonna put the explore item. So in every other slot, I might have like, my traditional LTR model that's ranking results using Lambda Mart or SVM rank or any of these sort of uh, traditional uh, learning to rank models. And then, uh, or not even learning to rank, some other solution that you know works well with your features. 
And then you slot in that like third result that's going to like explore a bit. It's going to be different um, or as many results as you want. Another completely different option is to use it as a means to drive um, in, in search results. It's not like we show people just like 10 results anymore. We give people lots of different, there's different UI widgets that are like off to the right, you might have something that looks a bit more like an ad or suggestions or in, in product recommendations or product search, we might have like sort of similar products to those that you searched for, like different kinds of prompts. And you might get sort of explored in those spaces too, to kind of get more click data and, and traffic to just sort of like explore what might be relevant. So it may, it depends a lot on like how you want to drive your UI and your specific use case and what might be appropriate. And, and this is, help me understand this, this is different from click models, right? Because we also have the click bias problem and we could introduce yeah, or re yeah. redistribute the click weight in a way to those unseen items. This You're is absolutely different. right. Is this different yeah, so or the same? It's different. So, um, so there, yeah, this is like, I'm talking about step two of a process. Step one, before you even get to here is you don't just want to take, like, if you search for shoe, and you notice something gets a certain click-through rate, it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily want to take that raw number of clicks because even within those things that you're showing users, different, just there is something called position bias, which is people might scan top to bottom and they're just going to click on the first result more than they're going to click on the second result. And there's lots of reasons for that. Even when they notice both, they're just gonna, they might say, oh, this algorithm must know what it's doing. Um, there are uh, people scan top to bottom um, and there are different reasons. People just like, will click the first result more than the second result and so on. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon of like psychology about how people process uh, search results that are even shown to them. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, just as you explained this, it occurred to me that have you noticed how um, you know the interface has changed? Like you go on YouTube watching these shorts, there is no way to search them, right? You just flip and you watch and watch. I because know, I think, yeah. Because I, I think at that point, first of all, there is no bias. You don't know what's next. Uh, but I think the goal is also more like entertainment. It's not like um, I have an information need, right? Mm -hmm. I'm actually searching for something. But I guess sometimes, and I think you also spoke about it, search uh, blends with recommender systems because we actually don't know and user might not know what they're looking for sometimes right mm -hmm, maybe sometimes mm -hmm. they do sometimes they don't like it's an explorative search which means it could become a recommender system which means you could plug in those explorative results exactly and it becomes a very um that blending it can be very uh interesting it's also can be challenging because Search is also a very intentional activity. And if you do something, uh, let's say in a, in, a, in a dense vector representation, there is some relationship that in a general sense, like when you train it on Wikipedia, it makes sense that these things go together. <laughs> but maybe in this specific domain, uh, this specific uh, profession, there's jargon, and it turns out those don't go together, people will notice and they'll complain about, about these things. Um, a, a, a sort of like actually domain independent example of this that you sometimes see is sometimes um, things that are opposites actually occur together. So you get like, um, I want to cancel my reservation or I want to confirm my reservation. Those sometimes co-occur with the same kinds of words. And sometimes in these retrieval situations, you might be able to get away with that in like a recommendations context where people are like, yeah, whatever. But when I'm searching, it's like, how, how dare you not understand me? And people almost get like offended by it because it's almost like going to a person at a store and asking a question and given the exact opposite <laughs> or something. Yeah, exactly. I think my wife was recently doing a search in one of the, uh, you know, grocery apps and uh, everything gets delivered home today, even in Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
and she was searching for oil and she was saying, hey, your uh, vector search, you know, research could be applied here probably. So the, the top result was tuna fish. And she was like, why? Uh, oh, maybe, maybe because oil is one of the components. It's, it's inside yeah. oil, right? So what do you want? But she was looking for a category of things. So like breads, right? And she was getting yogurts. Yeah. All of a sudden. Yeah. So I think that's, that, that's probably a negative example of explorative search, or maybe not. I'm not sure, but I think it is like you are puzzled as a user not to see breads on the on the page and seeing yogurts. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a good like example of a of a traditional search engine kind of doing that, where it's like oil, but it's tuna and oil, whereas uh, maybe a dense vector search might actually work better until you get old, like motor oil. Yeah. Where it's like so you, yeah both sides have to be tuned carefully because yeah you search can really search is one of those things and i think the uh, article we talked about a while ago about like the google article actually talks about this not just in terms of lost revenue but in terms of brand retention because people will not come back to your store if they're like the search doesn't get me this seems dumb so it's it's a uh, it definitely yeah people people notice when the search is not understanding them yeah 300 billion dollar opportunity for everyone yeah uh, out there so in this maze of things learning to rank dance retrieval we still need to also um get concerned with how we manage these projects right and uh, you yeah. have a lot of a lot of ideas here and thoughts uh but like i'm particularly interested in this um in the search engineer role transcending itself to something else. For example, it used to be, I don't know, I was tuning, I was a solar relevancy search engineer, I guess, a few years ago. And I was just reading these XML files and tweaking and tweaking and then, you know, mm -hmm. you know, indexing search pipeline and so on. But today you mentioned this data science came into play and it's still in being integrated what what other aspects do we need to think about? How should we form search teams? Uh, I believe you have a blog post on that as well. We will cite this in the show notes. Oh yeah, a Shopify and I know a Shopify engineering blog. I know Eric Pugh at Open Source Connections talks about it a lot too. Um, yeah, and I can't say I have all the answers because I feel like it's a. You're right. It's a brand new space. I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. <laughs> I think there's two principles I think about when I think about a search team and you can't, you have to do both. And it, it's like, it's like uh, building a plane while you're flying it. So you always, <clears throat> you can't be the, I, I remember at Open Source Connections, sometimes we would get in projects that would be very, almost like too infrastructure focused. Uh, and then other projects that would be too, only building the experiments and solutions. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes the infrastructure focused experiments is more like, oh, we're gonna gather, we're gonna spend nine months gathering clicks and processing it and trying to understand what's relevant before even touching a model or, or tuning relevance or whatever. And then the other end of the spectrum, you have systems that are just like, we're not even gonna try to understand what's relevant, just tune things and you know, YOLO, ship it, and hopefully, hopefully things uh, hopefully things look good. And we'll, you know, and honestly, both of those are anti-patterns because obviously on the case where we just like study the problem, we never actually deliver anything. And uh, not just as a consultant, but as a practitioner working on a team, your stakeholders are gonna lose patience. They're, you're not gonna have much success. <clears throat> on the other hand, um, I've seen like, I've had, I had one project where spent months and months and months developing experiments. They did have the ability to A-B test, but we didn't really have any ability to understand or dig below underneath like what was happening at a query level or anything where we just spend months and months experimenting and through a dozen experiments at the wall for A-B tests, none of them turned out to matter. And I suspect in that case, it was um, turned out to be a, a performance issue or a UX issue that was actually more the problem. And um, really what you have to be doing in this relevant space is 
shipping experiments all the time with whatever the infrastructure you have to support them while simultaneously like changing the engine that you're using to like understand the quality of relevance. So as an example, you might do something like start out with Cupid and start shipping things just incrementally with Cupid, getting people's feedback as bad as it might be, knowing it's wrong um, and start shipping changes. But at the same time, with you're doing that with your right hand and with your left hand, you're kind of going in like, oh, we have to start gathering click data because eventually the Cupid experimentation might hit diminishing returns or might get at really subtle cases that people aren't going to be able to easily tell me the difference. And if you're not doing both, you're, uh, you're really going to get yourself into trouble. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You really described it as a, not an individual level experience, but like a team level experience, right? Like, and now, well, everyone can figure uh, out, okay, add a data scientist, add a UX person, add the product manager, add the mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. search engineers and work together in one single concert, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and that's a tricky thing to build because, um, so the first thing, yeah, you, you do need all those roles um, and you need a tremendous amount of data literacy. So not only do you need, uh, you need those roles, you need like, probably a good strong core of engineering and data working together. So that's probably a good place to start. But as you add, as you eventually add like someone like a product manager, like what does a product manager on a search team do? Um, and that's a really interesting question because I think it's quite different than building other features. A product manager on a search team is constantly looking at data, trying to let's just say at the query level, because it doesn't have to be at the query level, it could be a user or whatever, is trying to say like, here's a cluster of problems we have or opportunities. Maybe it's this kind of search, a search for um, colors and products or a search for this type of terminology. And then have some like, has to have the ability to do the, constantly do the analysis of that data, advocate for data, that they need to get implemented. And then um, understand to some level, like when they work with their data and engineering team, what are the experiments? Like, let's think about half a dozen experiments that could treat this problem, prioritize and triage them in terms of reward, effort, trade-off, and, um, and really plan out how we do those experiments. And when you do that planning, it's not just about planning the like, nuts and bolts of how we get this experiment into production. Like we built this pipeline, we do these things. It's also building the like, how will we measure how we answer the questions about those experiments? Um, and that's a pretty, I feel like that's one of the toughest roles. That's a unicorn that is, is, is hard, to, uh, hard to have someone with all of those skills, but it's also really essential to really be able to um, to have a really successful search team. Really accurately put. I mean, I, I'm still learning the product manager, uh, you know, role myself, but like, that's exactly right. You know, like you need to generate uh, the insight for yourself. You, you, you're constantly like a detective work, you know, you keep looking. For yeah, it. that's uh, a good way of putting it. You're a detective. Uh, yep. You have to be a really good detective. And then you have to like, you also have to like figure out where you're going to go digging as a detective. Well, am I going to, maybe I need to set up like a team of manual labelers because there's something on our click data that's not quite right or, or do something different with our click data. And it's like, you really have to be able to understand and appreciate how uh, the nature of your evidence. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, maybe to add to that, like when I used to be an engineer, what do you do daily? You open Jira and you say, what's the next ticket on my name? So somebody thought about it. Somebody says what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you that this might be an experiment, but like it's given, right? With product management, I don't open Jira. I don't know what to do. Every day I'm like, let's think, uh, you know, okay, look at metrics, uh, look at query logs, uh, see what the engineering has done, what experiment we just completed. Try to combine this pieces into a puzzle. Yeah, model. what did we learn from that experiment and like what might be the next step? Yeah. Yeah, 
and and also uh, subscribing to bold changes uh, sometimes it's easy to kind of go uh, step by step evolutionary you know uh, but sometimes you need to jump over a few steps yeah uh, requires boldness and then messaging that and saying hey we need we need this i know and it's almost like going after it, it makes me think of going after like you know to get a get um get grant research for like most you know in the U.S., if you uh, if you want to do some big research project at a university, you go to a government agency and you give this big proposal. And for these big bets, you almost like it's almost like that, where it's like, you yes, we have this like side over here that's just constantly evolving, whatever currently works. But then like for these big bets, you almost have to think about it in terms of like we want to spend X amount of time researching this area to see if this direction works out and then as part of that you also have to be like these are the early tests the prototypes before we build the big thing to know if we should invest even further and that's that's a tricky thing i think that's something a really good product manager can sort of like coach the stakeholders and thinking about these things of like uh and and thinking about them as bets uh not thinking about them as like sure things that we know are going to work out is also really important yeah exactly um yeah I, just one example came to came to my mind uh that uh was it ebay when they didn't have uh type ahead when they added it they they tapped into some like 100 million dollar market you know because uh -huh. because you reduce the the time spent in each uh, search session, right? Mm -hmm. You might get there faster, which means you will get a faster transaction or like get yeah. there faster. So yeah, totally. That makes probably, sense. Probably, probably was in, in involving product management thinking, what if we do this? But it's yeah, it's like outside of box thinking, really. Yeah, totally, totally. And I. Before we close off, I mean, I really enjoyed this conversation, Doug, and I think we could yeah, uh, speak entire day. <laughs> you know, my totally, engineer yeah. having like a lot of fun now, like really getting into this. Um, but I love asking this question and you partially answered it during this podcast, the why question. Uh, what really, like you've done a ton. It's not just that you imagine doing things or told someone to do, you actually did it yourself. Like Qubit, learning to rank, plug in, Splainer, you know, books, um, all of these really physical, almost physical objects, right? <laughs> books are, for the matter. Yeah. So, and but you still keep going and going. And I mean, you talk at conferences, you push so much material on LinkedIn and on Twitter, I barely can follow up. Like, what drives you in this space? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> I think... I think what gets me excited about this space is how, A, it feels like the future of how people interact with with, com with computers. Like search is the Google, for example, for a long time people called Google, like it's really a command line interface, but it understands natural language. And I feel like more and more interfaces are this like fuzzy interaction that's search-like. And it's this thing creeping up on us that people aren't quite realizing. Um, and then the other, it, that just makes it a fascinating field of like the intersection of data and engineering and product and UX. And you have to have all of these parts of your brain working together to help sort of like understand and solve the problem. Um, it's really just a, it's a huge intellectual challenge. But I, you know, more, it, you know, more foundationally, just like I find like interacting with interesting and great people in the field also just drives me it's just how fun it is to interact out there with people like you dimitri and other people who are just like also get excited about the problem and like to nerd out about it so that also kind of drives me it's just the social aspect of sharing my crazy ideas or products or books and getting feedback and like continuing the conversation yeah and i think it's endless you're doing a great contribution there but it's like endless journey in many ways right so many facets, uh, so much totally. dimensionality. Yeah, totally, um, absolutely. And of course, I think uh, people want to learn these things. Um, I myself as well. Uh, from time to time, I'm subscribed to a course, and I I just uh, have the blast of I don't know four weeks, two months, whatever. 
not for the certificate but for the for the knowledge and for that feeling of connection <laughs> to that knowledge uh and with that i want to uh, ask you if you have any announcements for our... yeah so i i'm doing a course with uh sphere sphere is a fantastic um company that is sort of trying to build these like next level courses you know it's not your basic udemy course where you're learning some basic things it's really like it's almost like a master class with a professional and they are really focused on machine learning engineering right now. So they have recommender systems and all these things And I'm doing an ML powered search course. Um, and it really covers a lot of these things that we've talked about starting from, you know, just appreciating the relevance problem to building up learning to rank models and really focus on the problem of ranking. And then also discovery of doing feature exploration and training data exploration to try to figure out what's even relevant beyond the sort of filter bubble of our current search algorithms. So um, if you're interested in that, catch up with me at it's getsphere.com. Um, and you can find the ML powered search course. And then of course, like I, all of my other things out there, AI powered search uh, written with Trey and Max um, and relevant search, of course, hopefully still still relevant, so to speak, uh, and uh, and all the great stuff out there that, uh, that I think uh, people find interesting and useful. And of course, I also want to continue to plug open source connections. They have great training, consulting courses. Uh, I was, you know, a key part of training up that team as a great place, as a resource that you can go to, so. Yeah, this is fantastic announcement. And also, thanks for that. And I, I also want to say that I enjoy the reason I enjoy reading your book relevant search is not only because you share a bunch there like for example indexing songs I was like what like <laughs> inverted index yeah you can if you want it uh your way of writing is very thorough um it's like you create a network of thought as I go through the text mm. you say we will talk about it later but let me spend a few sentences still explaining what I mean and I'm like it's like a conversation and yeah, uh, I, try, I try to be conversational, including like the typical like bad jokes and sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm also learning on that side. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's fantastic. And uh, that gives that feel and uh, keep keep going, keep doing this. I, I enjoy following what you do and connecting once in a while. You sometimes give me really good advice on, you know, how to oh, sure, raise, yeah. raise the title in the blog post or should I venture into this or not and things like that. <laughs> That's amazing, um, this cross-pollination. So I'm enjoying it a lot and um, I recommend everyone to subscribe to your course. We will, of course, uh, link it. Um, Thank yeah, you. And yeah. have fun, have fun. Oh, definitely, will do. Awesome. Thanks so much, Doug. Uh, I enjoyed it and uh, see you soon, hopefully in person. Yeah. Yep. Same. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Take care.